Hello there, everyone. This is Gage Williams coming at you with the next installment of Taking Down the Oxide Ghosts. Uh, the first thing you were going to notice today is that we are selecting Cortex for only the second time in the series, as we are going to Cortex Castle. So I felt that was pretty fitting. But the real reasoning is that uh, picking someone other, this picking Dingo Dial or Tiny due to their handling actually makes this uh, more difficult than it needs to be. I mean, clearly, it can be done with them, but there's no reason to make it that difficult unless you're truly going for the best time you can. So if you're just going to beat the Oxide Ghosts, I would recommend taking a handling character. I mean, it, it can be tricky getting around some of these really tight corners. I mean, every turn, with the exception of the very top, when you go out near these little towers, every turn is a right angle. 90 degrees, so... Wow, they were screwing up right away. So, uh, in Tiny and Dingo Dial, they struggle with really tight turns like this, because quarter cutting and whatnot, I mean, they just, they're too loose. It's hard to get around certain areas of this track. Uh, so, yeah, this is Cortex Castle. I really like this track. I really do. I think the music is fantastic. There I go again, talking about music in one of these. I think the layout's interesting with all the 90 degree angles. I mean, it's kind of annoying at times, like I hit that wall uh, earlier, but uh, it's it's interesting. It's certainly more one of the more unique track layouts. And you got a massive jump in there because those are always exciting. And then it's just got a generally good atmosphere. I mean, it feels like a castle. You got all these like mid-air open bits that are interesting to go through. There are these rugs placed everywhere. I mean, it's kind of empty for a castle, I suppose, but it's it's a kart racer. What, what are you expecting here? It's, it's an old kart racer. So, uh, this is, you, as you've probably noticed, going to be one of the longer runs because I struggled with this a bit. Uh, this took the second most amount of time of the series so far to make behind Dingo Canyon, because of course it did. Uh, Polar Pass was before this, but yeah, this took a while, because I've been trying on and off, off and on uh, to get it down with Dingo Dial, and I just don't think that I'm consistent enough at one area in particular. Uh, it's actually the section that's coming up right next year. It, it, it just keeps throwing me off as Dingo Dial. This little area right here, this little, like, chicane of sorts, just always, I just always seem to hit the wall as Dingo Dial there, no matter what I do, at least once per race, anyway. Not every lap, but I just can't seem to get a clean lap off without hitting that wall as Dingo Dial, so I ju basically just threw in the towel and said, let's see if it can be done with someone with a little bit better handling. So I was getting a little worried, because uh, the speed difference is really noticeable. Like, seriously, it's it's not some small thing. The, the speed difference is very noticeable between Dingo Dial, Tiny, and basically anybody else that's below them. <clears throat> you really get to missing that top speed, because then it becomes difficult to catch up with Oxide with just drifts. You really have to just stretch out as much as you can to get every drift possible. Otherwise, you're... You're just not gonna do it, he's not fast enough. <clears throat> I apologize for the coughing, I've been still having a bit of a head cold, it's just coming back recently. Can't do it, anything about it really, but uh, we're gonna try and limit that, naturally, because no one likes to hear that. So, uh, in terms of like updates and whatnot, I know it's been a bit sporadic again, it's been going off and on. Uh, E3 happened, I've uh, been very excited for E3, been watching a lot of that. Uh, got New Leaf, Animal Crossing New Leaf, so I've been busy starting out with that. And, uh, I've been having a bit of computer problems, just a few. I mean, my hard drive that I save all these to has been acting up. I don't have near enough hard drive space on this laptop to record videos straight to the onboard hard drive. I just don't. So I need to use a portable one, which is a big no-no usually in terms of recording. I know you don't want to record to external stuff, but it is genuinely the only way I can do it. I just flat out, I'm, I'm thankful that I'm able to record it all. And you'll notice this has been a very bad run so far. I've hit, I've hit a wall, I've fallen off the track, I've hit a spider, I've basically been stopped by everything that can happen in this track. 
I've, I've just ticked all the boxes with obstacles, and that's not what you want to do by any means. So, uh, I mean, I'm still going to beat Entropy. I mean, seriously, guys, Entropy is not difficult to take down in, in Crash Team Racing. It's... You, you shouldn't struggle with Entropy too much. I just really... It's... Look, I'm already past him. It's... It's silly. I've, I know oh, I've, fuck. like, harped on it before in past episodes, but seriously, do not worry about Entropy at all. Don't even take him as, like, a judgment of how good Oxide is, because he's just... I would say except for Dingo Canyon. Dingo Canyon, he's not that bad, but <laughs> that's because Dingo Canyon is brutally difficult for some reason. So, as for track tips, I'm gonna... <coughs> uh, well, a lot of it just comes down to your ability to judge your spacing in your drifts. Now, what do I mean by that? I don't mean, like, the space between your things, but you have to get a firm grip on, you know, how loosely your character will drift. Uh, here's another thing, this shortcut is very easy to make, I had almost no speed there, you just have to jump at the right time, take a good angle. But yes, judging the spacing on your drifts. Uh, basically, it doesn't have anything to do with actually spacing between the drifts, it's more, what I mean, the spacing between you and whatever obstacle you need to avoid, be it a wall, be it a spider, or a gap. You have to know how loosely your character drifts, you have to be very comfortable with it. That's why I've been doing somewhat poorly as Cortex here, because I'm not used to having a, a middling character. I'm used to having loose drifting with Dingo Dial and Tiny. It's, it's just how it is. I'm extremely comfortable, I'm extremely familiar, and I know how loosely they drift. Cortex, I don't know how loosely he drifts. I rarely ever play as him, so I sometimes I misjudge him, and that's that's an important thing that you have to learn. I would find what I would predetermine what character you want to use, and I would just go at this multiple times, just so you know that you're drift, so you know the width of your drifting, so you know how much you can get away with without hitting the wall. Very important to know. This shortcut, jumping across that gap there. It's not that difficult, but you have to master it. <coughs> uh, the spiders don't mistime them terribly like I just did. It's Their timing's not that bad, I just jumped the gun a little bit and didn't try to dodge it. Just, just go between them, there's no penalty for going between the spiders. It's, it's safer, arguably faster. It's just, seriously, It's there's no reason to try and gamble if you don't have to. Um, be really careful with the chicane. I mentioned it earlier, but that's why I'm using Cortex, is because I could not get by that little, uh, that little divot of a turn without hitting the wall at least once per race, and hitting the wall in basically any, uh, track, any ghost that you face, is basically a run killer. Hitting the wall is one of the worst things you can do. I mean, you can, like, graze a wall, that's still bad, it still makes you lose speed, but it doesn't make you come to basically a complete stop. I mean, coming to a complete stop is always a bad idea. And honestly, hitting a wall is sometimes worse than falling off a pit or hitting an obstacle because uh, you have to reposition yourself. The game will basically reposition yourself for you if you fall off a pit. It'll place you in the middle and you can get a quick boost when it drops you back into play. If you hit an obstacle like a spider, that I suppose that is bad as well. It's about just as bad, especially if you hit an obstacle and then go into a wall. Because uh, repositioning is a terrible affliction that you don't want to have to deal with. It's, it's seriously, it's one of the worst things that happens as time trials, is having to <laughs> reposition yourself. You want to be able to just follow a steady line throughout the whole track uh, without having to break from it too much. That's why uh, an old video of mine, old one of these, I don't remember what track, I think it might be Sewer Speedway? I made a comment that uh, time trials can be a bit brainless at times. Now, I love time trials, and it does require a lot of thought, a lot of planning, and a lot of experience, but once you get going, you get into this groove where you basically stop thinking about what you're doing. You just, you already know what path you want to take. You know what you want to do, and so you just try to follow it to a T. 
and if you get off of that line, then you kind of just subconsciously go into a bit of a panic mode, like, okay, what, what do I do now? It's, this isn't part of the plan, how do I adjust to this? Right there uh, was bringing back that little hopping exploit that I talked about in the last video. I believe it was the last video, anyway. Polar Pass, I could be wrong there, but... That hopping exploit is important. You will need it for one track in particular, and it's helpful in others. Basically, you just hop a lot while you're turning, and if you do it right, I can't properly explain how to do it right, this is just something you gotta experiment with. Just hop while turning, and it becomes very easy to keep a lot of your momentum and get around a very tight corner or obstacle. I mean, it's not as fast as drifting, but you basically lose almost no speed as compared to just turning or slowing down in general. Like right there, I just used it again. I was able to hop around that corner, back into a good position, and I lost barely any speed. It's a very important skill that you'll need for one of the later tracks. It's helpful here in positions too, I mean... It's a little bit questionable as to whether or not it's considered an exploit. I don't think it is, personally. I, I believe the hopping mechanics were implemented the way they were for a reason. Uh, I would only qualify exploits as anything that really seems genuinely buggy or glitchy, and this hopping thing doesn't seem too buggy to me. I mean, you're hopping. It's, it's programmed that you can hop into a drift without losing your speed. So if you hop and just don't do the drift, then you shouldn't lose any speed. I'm restarting there because I just realized this video has been going on long enough and I could tell just from checking the track map that uh, there was no way I was going to catch them. Not with Cortex. It's, Cortex just isn't fast enough to even like come up with a feasible comeback from that distance. That brings up a good point of discussion that I've uh, kind of neglected to talk about for this series, to my knowledge, and that is the track map itself. You can switch that to a speedometer that tells you, you know, how fast you're going. That's what most time trial players on CTR tend to use, because it's a good way to check how fast you're going, if you're drifting enough to get into those boosts and whatnot. And honestly, in time trials, uh, the track map doesn't really help you any. I mean, it's... Most of the time, it's just you racing. You don't need to know where anybody else is. But I like to have the track map up for two reasons. Uh, number one, I just like to admire the track layouts. I mean, I have been absolutely fascinated with track layouts and the design work that goes into creating a track ever since I was a child. When I was a child, I used to just make all these drawings of overhead track maps just for fictional tracks that I would imagine being in different kart racing games that I played. Just because I really, I found it fun to make tracks. I mean, even in things like Minecraft, I like to make uh, racing tracks. I just, it's just something I really like to do. So I like to admire the, de the design work that goes into them. I mean, they, I think they're cool. But for a series like this, the reason I like them is it's a good way to check on uh, how much work you have left to go to take down Oxide, or to beat your old time. I was able to realize in the last, uh, in the last run attempt that I had that I just was not going to be able to do it because of how far away they were. I was able to just take a quick glance and then go, yeah, there's... I just don't see a way for Cortex to catch them. He's just not fast enough. Now that seems a little bit dejected, like giving up, I realize, but uh, it's... It, I mean, it is what it is. It's helpful. And especially when making a video, you want to keep them at least a little bit short. I've kind of neglected to do that here, but I had a lot to talk about with Cortex Castle. It was actually pretty on topic, I like to think. As for any remaining thoughts on the track, not really. It's all going to come down to just raw drifting skill in this one. Just being able to space yourself away from the corners, but still be able to drift through each of them. I mean, it's important. There's a lot going on at Cortex Castle. Thank you all for watching, stay tuned for more in the series, and hope you enjoyed.